The capitalist buys labor power in order to use it, and labor power in use is labor itself. The purchaser of labor power consumes it by setting the seller of it to work. By working, the latter becomes actually what before he was only potentially, labor power in action, a laborer. In order that his labor may reappear in a commodity, he must, before all things, expend it on something useful, on something capable of satisfying a want of some sort. Hence, what the capitalist sets the laborer to produce is a particular use value, a specified article. The fact that the production of use values, or goods, is carried on under the control of a capitalist and on his behalf, does not alter the general character of that production. We shall, therefore, in the first place, have to consider labor process independently of the particular form it assumes under given social conditions. Labor is, in the first place, a process in which both man and nature participate, and in which man, of his own accord, starts, regulates, and controls the material reactions between himself and nature. He opposes himself to nature as one of her own forces, setting in motion arms and legs, head and hands, the natural forces of his body, in order to appropriate nature's productions in a form adapted to his own wants. By thus acting on the external world and changing it, he at the same time changes his own nature. He develops his slumbering powers and compels them to act in obedience to his sway. We are not now dealing with those primitive, instinctive forms of labor that remind us of the mere animal. An immeasurable interval of time separates the state of things in which a man brings his labor power to market for sale as a commodity from that state in which human labor was still in its first instinctive stage. We presuppose labor in a form that stamps it as exclusively human. A spider conducts operations that resemble those of a weaver, and a bee puts to shame many an architect in the construction of her cells. But what distinguishes the worst architect from the best of bees is this, that the architect raises his structure in imagination before he erects it in reality. At the end of every labor process, we get a result that already existed in the imagination of the laborer at its commencement. He not only effects a change of form in the material on which he works, but he also realizes a purpose of his own that gives the law to his modus operandi, and to which he must subordinate his will. And this subordination is no mere momentary act. Besides the exertion of the bodily organs, the process demands that, during the whole operation, the workman's will be steadily in consonance with his purpose. This means close attention. The less he is attracted by the nature of the work, and the mode in which it is carried on, and the less, therefore, he enjoys it as something which gives play to his bodily and mental powers, the more close his attention is forced to be. The elementary factors of the labor process are, 1. The personal activity of man, i.e., work itself. 2. The subject of that work. And 3. Its instruments. The soil, and this, economically speaking, includes water, in the virgin state in which it supplies man with necessities, or the means of subsistence ready to hand, exists independently of him and is the universal subject of human labor. Footnote. The earth's spontaneous productions, being in small quantity and quite independent of man, appear, as it were, to be furnished by nature, in the same way as a small sum is given to a young man, in order to put him in a way of industry, and of making his fortune. James Stewart, Principles of Political Economics, Edition Dublin, 1770, Volume 1, page 116. And footnote. All those things which labor merely separates from immediate connection with their environment are subjects of labor, 
spontaneously provided by nature. Such are fish which we catch and take from their element, water, timber which we fell in the virgin forest, and ores which we extract from their veins. If, on the other hand, the subject of labor has, so to say, been filtered through previous labor, we call it raw material. Such is ore already extracted and ready for washing. All raw material is the subject of labor, but not every subject of labor is raw material. It can only become so after it has undergone some alteration by means of labor. An instrument of labor is a thing or a complex of things, which the laborer interposes between himself and the subject of his labor, and which serves as the conductor of his activity. He makes use of the mechanical, physical, and chemical properties of some substances in order to make other substances subservient to his aims. Footnote. Reason is just as cunning as she is powerful. Her cunning consists principally in her mediating activity, which, by causing objects to act and react on each other in accordance with their own nature, in this way, without any direct interference in the process, carries out reason's intentions. Hegel, Encyclopadie Erster Teil, Die Logik, Berlin, 1840, page 382. End footnote. Leaving out of consideration such ready-made means of subsistence as fruits, and gathering which a man's own limbs serve as the instruments of his labor, the first thing of which the laborer possesses himself is not the subject of labor, but its instrument. Thus nature becomes one of the organs of his activity, one that he annexes to his own bodily organs, adding stature to himself in spite of the Bible. As the earth is his original larder, so too is it his original tool-house. It supplies him, for instance, with stones for throwing, grinding, pressing, cutting, etc. The earth itself is an instrument of labor, but when used as such in agriculture, implies a whole series of other instruments and a comparatively high development of labor. Footnote. In his otherwise miserable work, Theorie de l'économie politique, Paris, 1815, Ganiel enumerates in a striking manner, in opposition to the physiocrats, the long series of previous processes necessary before agriculture, properly so called, can commence. End footnote. No sooner does labor undergo the least development then it requires specially prepared instruments. Thus, in the oldest caves we find stone implements and weapons. In the earliest period of human history, domesticated animals, i.e., animals which have been bred for the purpose and have undergone modifications by means of labor, play the chief part as instruments of labor, along with specially prepared stones, wood, bones, and shells. Footnote. Turgot, in his Reflexion sur la formation et la distribution des richesses, 1766, brings well into prominence the importance of domesticated animals to early civilization. End footnote. The use and fabrication of instruments of labor, although existing in the germ among certain species of animals, is specifically characteristic of the human labor process, and Franklin, therefore, defines man as a tool-making animal. Relics of bygone instruments of labor possess the same importance for the investigation of extinct economic forms of society, as do fossil bones for the determination of extinct species of animals. It is not the articles made, but how they are made, and by what instruments, that enables us to distinguish different economic epochs. Footnote. The least important commodities of all, for the technological comparison of different epochs of production, are articles of luxury, 
in the strict meaning of the term. However little our written histories up to this time notice the development of material production, which is the basis of all social life, and therefore of all real history, yet prehistoric times have been classified in accordance with the results, not of so-called historical, but of materialistic investigations. These periods have been divided to correspond with the materials from which their implements and weapons were made, viz., into the stone, the bronze, and the iron ages. End footnote. Instruments of labor not only supply a standard of the degree of development to which human labor has attained, but they are also indicators of the social conditions under which that labor is carried on. Among the instruments of labor, those of a mechanical nature, which, taken as a whole, we may call the bone and muscles of production, offer much more decided characteristics of a given epoch of production than those which, like pipes, tubs, baskets, jars, etc., serve only to hold the materials for labor, which latter class, we may in a general way, call the vascular system of production. The latter first begins to play an important part in the chemical industries. In a wider sense, we may include among the instruments of labor, in addition to those things that are used for directly transferring labor to its subject, and which, therefore, in one way or another, serve as conductors of activity, all such objects as are necessary for carrying on the labor process. These do not enter directly into the process, but without them it is either impossible for it to take place at all, or possible only to a partial extent. Once more we find the earth to be a universal instrument of this sort, for it furnishes a locus standi to the laborer and a field of employment for his activity. Among instruments that are the result of previous labor, and also belong to this class, we find workshops, canals, roads, and so forth. In the labor process, therefore, man's activity, with the help of the instruments of labor, affects an alteration, designed from the commencement in the material worked upon. The process disappears in the product. The latter is a use value. Nature's material adapted by a change of form to the wants of man. Labor has incorporated itself with its subject. The former is materialized, the latter transformed. That which in the laborer appeared as movement now appears in the product as a fixed quality without motion. The blacksmith forges, and the product is a forging. If we examine the whole process from the point of view of its result, the product, it is plain that both the instruments and the subject of labor are means of production. Footnote. It appears paradoxical to assert that uncaught fish, for instance, are a means of production in the fishing industry. But hitherto, no one has discovered the art of catching fish in waters that contain none. And, footnote, and that the labor itself is productive labor. Footnote. This method of determining, from the standpoint of the labor process alone, what is productive labor, is by no means directly applicable to the case of the capitalist process of production. And, footnote. Though a use value, in the form of a product, issues from the labor process, yet other use values, products of previous labor, enter into it as means of production. The same use value is both the product of a previous process and a means of production in a later process. Products are therefore not only results, but also essential conditions of labor. With the exception of the extractive industries, in which the material for labor is provided immediately by nature, such as mining, hunting, fishing, and agriculture, 
so far as the latter is confined to breaking up virgin soil, all branches of industry manipulate raw material. Objects already filtered through labor, already products of labor, such as seed and agriculture, animals and plants, which we are accustomed to consider as products of nature, are in their present form not only products of, say, last year's labor, but the result of a gradual transformation, continued through many generations, under man's superintendence, and by means of his labor. But in the great majority of cases, instruments of labor show even to the most superficial observer traces of the labor of past ages. Raw material may either form the principal substance of a product, or it may enter into its formation only as an accessory. An accessory may be consumed by the instruments of labor, as coal under a boiler, oil by a wheel, hay by draft horses, or it may be mixed with the raw material in order to produce some modification thereof, as chlorine into unbleached linen, coal with iron, dye stuff with wool, or again, it may help to carry on the work itself, as in the case of the materials used for heating and lighting workshops. The distinction between principal substance and accessory vanishes in the true chemical industries, because there, none of the raw material reappears, in its original composition, in the substance of the product. Footnote Storch calls true raw materials Matia and accessory material materiu. Cherboulier describes accessories as matir instrumental. And footnote. Every object possesses various properties and is thus capable of being applied to different uses. One and the same product may therefore serve as raw material in very different processes. Corn for example, is a raw material for millers, starch manufacturers, distillers, and cattle breeders. It also enters as raw material into its own production in the shape of seed. Coal, too, is at the same time the product of, and a means of production in, coal mining. Again, a particular product may be used in one and the same process both as an instrument of labor and as raw material. Take, for instance, the fattening of cattle, where the animal is the raw material, and at the same time an instrument for the production of manure. A product, though ready for immediate consumption, may yet serve as raw material for further product, as grapes when they become the raw material for wine. On the other hand, Labor may give us its product in such a form that we can use it only as raw material, as is the case with cotton, thread, and yarn. Such a raw material, though itself a product, may have to go through a whole series of different processes, and each of these, in turn, it serves with constantly varying form as raw material, until the last process of the series leaves it a perfect product, ready for individual consumption or for use as an instrument of labor. Hence we see that whether a use value is to be regarded as raw material, as instrument of labor, or as product, this is determined entirely by its function in the labor process, by the position it there occupies. As this varies, so does its character. Whenever, therefore, a product enters as a means of production into a new labor process, it thereby loses its character of product and becomes a mere factor in the process. A spinner treats spindles only as implements for spinning, and flax only as the material that he spins. Of course, it is impossible to spin without material and spindles, and therefore the existence of these things as products at the commencement of the spinning operation, must be presumed. But in the process itself, the fact that they are products of previous labor 
is a matter of utter indifference. Just as in the digestive process, it is of no importance whatever that bread is the produce of the previous labor of the farmer, the miller, and the baker. On the contrary, it is generally by their imperfections as products that these means of production in any process assert themselves in their character of products. A blunt knife or weak thread forcibly remind us of Mr. A, the cutler, or Mr. B, the spinner. In the finished product, the labor by means of which it has acquired its useful qualities is not palpable, has apparently vanished. A machine, which does not serve the purposes of labor, is useless. In addition, it falls a prey to the destructive influence of natural forces. Iron rusts and wood rots. Yarn, with which we neither weave nor knit, is caught and wasted. Living labor must seize upon these things and rouse them from their death sleep, change them from mere possible use values into real and effective ones. Bathed in the fire of labor, appropriated as part and parcel of labor's organism, and, as it were, made alive for the performance of their functions in the process, they are in truth consumed, but consumed with a purpose, as elementary constituents of new use values, of new products, ever ready as means of subsistence for individual consumption, or as means of production for some new labor process. If then, on the one hand, finished products are not only results, but also necessary conditions, of the labor process, on the other hand, their assumption into that process, their contact with living labor, is the sole means by which they can be made to retain their character of use values, and be utilized. Labor uses up its material factors, its subject and its instruments, consumes them, and is therefore a process of consumption. Such productive consumption is distinguished from individual consumption by this, that the latter uses up products as means of subsistence for the living individual. The former, as means whereby alone labor, the labor power of the living individual, is enabled to act. The product, therefore, of individual consumption is the consumer himself. The result of productive consumption is a product distinct from the consumer. In so far, then, as its instruments and subjects are themselves products, labor consumes products in order to create products, or, in other words, consumes one set of products by turning them into means of production for another set. But, just as in the beginning, the only participators in the labor process were man and the earth, which latter exists independently of man. So even now we still employ in the process many means of production provided directly by nature, that do not represent any combination of natural substances with human labor. The labor process, resolved as above into its simple elementary factors, is human action with a view to the production of use values, appropriation of natural substances to human requirements. It is the necessary condition for effecting change of matter between man and nature. It is the everlasting nature-imposed condition of human existence, and therefore is independent of every social phase of that existence, or rather, is common to every such phase. It was, therefore, not necessary to represent our laborer in connection with other laborers, man and his labor on one side, nature and its materials on the other, sufficed. As the taste of porridge does not tell you who grew the oats, no more does this simple process tell you of itself what are the social conditions under which it is taking place whether under the slave-owner's brutal lash 
or the anxious eye of the capitalist. Whether Cincinnatus carries it on in tilling his modest farm, or a savage in killing wild animals with stones. Footnote By a wonderful feat of logical acumen, Colonel Torrens has discovered, in this stone of the savage, the origin of capital. In the first stone, which he, the savage, flings at the wild animal he pursues, and the first stick that he seizes to strike down the fruit which hangs above his reach, we see the appropriation of one article for the purpose of aiding in the acquisition of another, and thus discover the origin of capital. R. Torrens An Essay on the Production of Wealth, etc. Pages 70 to 71 End footnote Let us now return to our would-be capitalist. We left him just after he had purchased, in the open market, all the necessary factors of the labor process, its objective factors, the means of production, as well as its subjective factor, labor power. With the keen eye of an expert, he has selected the means of production and the kind of labor power best adapted to his particular trade, be it spinning, bootmaking, or any other kind. He then proceeds to consume the commodity, the labor power that he has just bought, by causing the laborer, the impersonation of that labor power, to consume the means of production by his labor. The general character of the labor process is evidently not changed by the fact that the laborer works for the capitalist instead of for himself. Moreover, the particular methods and operations employed in bootmaking or spinning, are not immediately changed by the intervention of the capitalist. He must begin by taking the labor power as he finds it in the market, and consequently be satisfied with labor of such a kind as would be found in the period immediately preceding the rise of capitalists. Changes in the methods of production by the subordination of labor to capital can take place only at a later period and therefore will have to be treated of in a later chapter. The labor process, turned into the process by which the capitalist consumes labor power, exhibits two characteristic phenomena. First, the laborer works under the control of the capitalist to whom his labor belongs, the capitalist taking good care that the work is done in a proper manner and that the means of production are used with intelligence, so that there is no unnecessary waste of raw material, and no wear and tear of the implements beyond what is necessarily caused by the work. Secondly, the product is the property of the capitalist, and not that of the laborer, its immediate producer. Suppose that a capitalist pays for a day's labor power at its value. Then the right to use that power for a day belongs to him just as much as the right to use any other commodity, such as a horse that he has hired for the day. To the purchaser of a commodity belongs its use, and the seller of labor power, by giving his labor, does no more, in reality, than part with the use value that he has sold. From the instant he steps into the workshop, the use value of his labor power, and therefore also its use, which is labor, belongs to the capitalist. By the purchase of labor power, the capitalist incorporates labor as a living ferment with the lifeless constituents of the product. From his point of view, the labor process is nothing more than the consumption of the commodity purchased, i.e. of labor power. But this consumption cannot be affected except by supplying the labor power with the means of production. The labor process is a process between things that the capitalist has purchased, things that have become his property. The product of this process belongs, therefore, to him, just as much as does the wine, which is the product of a process of fermentation completed in his cellar. 
Footnote. Products are appropriated before they are converted into capital. This conversion does not secure them from such appropriation. Chebule, Richesse aux pauvreté. Edition Paris, 1841, page 54. The proletarian, by selling his labor for a definite quantity of the necessaries of life, renounces all claim to a share in the product. The mode of appropriation of the products remains the same as before. It is in no way altered by the bargain we have mentioned. The product belongs exclusively to the capitalist, who supplied the raw material and the necessaries of life, and this is a rigorous consequence of the law of appropriation, a law whose fundamental principle was the very opposite, namely, that every laborer has an exclusive right to the ownership of what he produces. L.C., page 58. When the laborers receive wages for their labor, the capitalist is then the owner not of the capital only, he means the production, but of the labor also. If what is paid as wages is included, as it commonly is, in the term capital, it is absurd to talk of labor separately from capital. The word capital, as thus employed, includes labor and capital both. James Mill, Elements of Political Economics, etc., edition, 1821, pages 70 and 71.